Well, welcome to another Friday night. And because it's New Year's Eve, I thought I would just share you some video or I thought I would share with you some of the stuff that is encouraging quotes from some of the major leaders in the field of trauma and complex trauma. And I thought, well, why don't I just film it here where I live? Um, out in the open. So this is about two blocks from where I live. I live right next to the city of Detroit on the Detroit River in the city of Windsor in Canada. And so when I go out for a walk in the day, I usually walk along the river path and can see the Detroit skyline, which is a very beautiful thing. So I thought I'd just show you where I live. Um, so here's a whole bunch of quotes that I hope will encourage you. They just capture some nuggets of truth that are important to be reminded of. Fun ones. I hate that moment when you're tired and sleepy, but as soon as you go to bed, your body is like, nah, just kidding. That happens when you get older. Or don't bother walking a mile in my shoes. That would be boring. Spend 30 seconds in my head. That'll freak you right out. Okay, now to some serious ones. Childhood trauma can lead to an adulthood spent in survival mode, afraid to plant roots, to plan for the future, to trust, and to let joy in. It's a blessing to shift from surviving to thriving. It's not simple, but there is more than survival. I love that one. Mark Epstein has written, developmental trauma occurs when emotional pain cannot find a relational home in which it can be held. So the child has nobody to help them hold their pain. Wounded children have a rage, a sense of failed justice that burns in their souls. What do they do with that rage? Since they would never harm another, they turn that rage inward. They become the target of their own rage. They repeat in their thoughts the same harmful words that were spoken to them. They must lash out, but the only ones weak enough to attack are themselves. So sad. This one's quite profound. You can spend a lifetime trying to forget a few minutes of your childhood. The greater a child's terror and the earlier it is experienced, the harder it becomes to develop a strong and healthy sense of self. In other words, it intensifies and deepens the shame belief. Winona Judd wrote this, it sounds corny, but I've promised my inner child that never again will I ever abandon myself for anything or anyone else again. I'm still coping with my trauma, but coping by trying to find different ways to heal it rather than hide it. This one's quite interesting and thought provoking. Adoption loss is the only trauma in the world where the victims are expected by the whole of society to be grateful. Unfortunately, becoming a new and better you is a journey that many friendships won't survive. In other words, you're gonna lose some people on the way. One of the most powerful truths we can offer our children is the knowledge that we're all still learning. None of us have arrived. We all have room to grow. This frees our kids from expecting perfection of themselves or anyone else because they know that life is a journey from day one on. This one's become quite popular. Growth is painful, change is painful, but there's nothing as painful as staying stuck somewhere you don't belong. 
Recovery is not one and done. It's a lifelong journey that takes place one day, one step at a time. To make a difference in someone's life, you don't have to be brilliant, rich, beautiful, or perfect. You just have to care. Dr. Glenn Doyle writes this very thought provoking. The only reason I can run marathons comfortably now is because I've run marathons uncomfortably in the past. Running lousy, painful races taught me how to run good races. Failures are just those temporary things that set you up for comebacks. That's all. Taylor Grismore. Trauma may have taught you that you are responsible for holding everything together for everyone. Keeping others happy meant keeping yourself safe. In healing, may you take a step back to discern what belongs to you and what doesn't. May you release yourself from issues that aren't yours to solve. May you create space for your own happiness. And that's my hope for you too. Somebody said this, I don't know who here needs to hear this. Emotional regulation does not come easy or naturally if you didn't have healthy and stable co-regulation growing up. It's not your fault. In other words, learning emotional regulation is a difficult, slow, messy process. So be patient and kind to yourself. Connected to that, an escalated adult cannot de-escalate an escalated child. And this one is so wise. Empathy without boundaries often leads to harm. Andy Andrews. Life itself is a privilege, but to live well to the fullest, well, that is a choice. Dr. Gaber Mate, the attempt to escape pain is what causes pain. Mother Teresa, we need to find God and he cannot be found in noise and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. See how nature, trees, flowers, grass grows in silence. See the stars, the moon and the sun, how they move in silence. We need silence to be able to touch souls. And this profound statement from Mother Teresa, the most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unloved. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. In this life, we are all just walking up the mountain and we can sing as we climb or we can complain about our sore feet. Whichever we choose, we still got to do the hike. I decided a long time ago, singing made a lot more sense. Sigmund Freud. One day in retrospect, the years of struggle will strike you as the most beautiful. How true. Any relationship you have that could get ruined by having a conversation about your feelings, standards, and or expectation wasn't really stable enough to begin with. No one changes unless they want to. Not if you beg them, not if you shame them, not if you use reason, emotion, or tough love. There's only one thing that makes someone change their own realization that they need to do it. Rage is the untranslated trauma of our historical grief. Wounded healers aren't born or made. They create themselves by transforming their pain into power and adversity into strength. They are spiritual alchemists.
You can succeed if nobody else believes it, but you will never succeed if you don't believe in yourself. And I love this quote by Jody Carrington. Every time you think of calling a kid attention seeking this year, consider changing it to connection seeking and see how your perspective changes. Because that's what the child is really wanting is connection. Don't run from it. Don't bury it. Don't ignore it. Face it. Feel it. Heal it. The hardest thing in life is to know which bridge to cross and which to burn. Nothing in nature blooms all year. Be patient with yourself. Deep in their roots, all flowers store the light. In other words, we have times where our growth seems to stop. We enter a desert or a winter and we think maybe we're doing something wrong but actually it's just the changing of the seasons. Deepak Chopra said, every time you are tempted to react in the same old way, ask if you want to be a prisoner of the past or a pioneer of the future. On particularly rough days, I like to remind myself that my track record for getting through bad days so far is 100%, and that's pretty good. And this one is profound as well. Needs are needs. You cannot train a child to not have needs. You can only train her to not express them. The needs remain. Irrespective of whether they are expressed or inhibited, the needs remain. And there is now solid evidence linking unmet childhood needs to later mental health issues. The heaviest burdens that we carry are the thoughts in our head. Fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision. Such an important distinction. Now let's go to some of the researchers. So Bruce Perry, one of my favorites, who's written What Happened to You?, says this, the more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely he will be to recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. I agree 100%. He also says this, empathy underlies virtually everything that makes society work like trust, altruism, collaboration, love, charity. Failure to empathize is a key part of most social problems. Crime, violence, war, racism, child abuse, and inequity to name just a few. So this empathy thing is a big deal. He also says, we ignore the emotional needs of young children at our peril. Also, the most important thing that parents need to understand is that the brain of their child will become exactly what the child was exposed to. That is the beauty of the human brain. It is the mirror of the child's developmental experience. And then he wrote this one related to COVID. The most powerful buffer in times of stress and distress is our social connectedness. So let's all remember to stay physically distant but emotionally close. Reach out and connect. Even a short text or smiling face on Zoom can help. Regulate, relate, reason. And Pia Melody, who many have benefited from her work on codependency, says this. Healthy, intimate contact between people comes when one person shares his or her reality with the other and the other comprehends it without judging or trying to change it. 
And then Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote The Body Keeps the Score, again, one of my favorites. Being traumatized means continuing to organize your life as if the trauma were still going on, unchanged and immutable, as every new encounter or event is contaminated by the past. That's why we need to deal with the trauma. He also says this, the single most important issue for traumatized people is to find a sense of safety in their own bodies. And this, in order to change, people need to become aware of their sensations and the way their bodies interact with the world around them. Physical self-awareness is the first step in releasing the tyranny of the past. Traumatized people chronically feel unsafe inside their bodies. The past is alive in the form of gnawing interior discomfort. Their bodies are constantly bombarded by visceral warning signs. And in an attempt to control these processes, they often become expert at ignoring their gut feelings and in numbing awareness of what is played out inside. They learn to hide from their selves. So good. And then this trauma comes back as, re, as a reaction, not a memory. I like that. And then this, once you start approaching your body with curiosity rather than with fear, everything shifts. So the value of that mindfulness, curiosity. The parent-child connection is the most powerful mental health intervention known to mankind. So true. That's why trauma happens when that connection is broken. That's why we need reparenting, a new surrogate parent. And then this, being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. I agree. And then this, the big issue for traumatized people is that they don't own themselves anymore. Any loud sound, anybody insulting them, hurting them, saying bad things can hijack them away from themselves. And so what we have learned is that what makes you resilient to trauma is to own yourself fully. Stand up for yourself, own yourself, respect yourself. And then this, trauma really does confront you with the best and the worst. You see the horrendous things that people do to each other, but you also see resiliency, the power of love, the power of caring, the power of commitment, the power of commitment to oneself. The knowledge that there are things that are larger than our individual survivor, survival. And in some ways, I don't think you can appreciate the glory of life unless you know the dark side of life. Then writer, therapist, Diana Fosha. The roots of resilience are to be found in the sense of being understood by and existing in the mind and heart of a loving, attuned, and self-possessed others. In other words, children aren't naturally resilient. They're resilient when they have a parent who understands them, who carries them in their heart and loves them. Pete Walker, another popular writer on trauma. We do not have to let other people's irresponsible emotional expression alienate us from our feelings. And Peter Levine, another popular writer, trauma is hell on earth. Trauma resolved is a gift from the gods. So profound. He also says this, Trauma is perhaps the most avoided, ignored, belittled, denied, misunderstood, and untreated cause of human suffering. I would agree. 
Also, trauma is not what happens to us, but what we hold inside in the absence of an empathetic witness. When we have to carry it alone, when we don't have somebody who cares for us, then it's trauma. Then he says this, I have come to the conclusion that human beings are born with an innate capacity to triumph over trauma. I believe not only that trauma is curable, but that the healing process can be a catalyst for profound awakening, a portal opening to emotional and genuine spiritual transformation. Yes. Most of us have become separated from our natural instinctual selves. In particular, the part of us that can proudly, not disparagingly, be called animal. That one's worth thinking about. And then this one. It is how we respond to a traumatic event that determines whether trauma will be a cruel and punishing Medusa, turning us into stone or whether it will be a spiritual teacher taking us along vast and uncharted pathways. And then Pat Ogden, who's a well-known therapist. No matter how much a couple wants it to work, until they learn about the implicit sig signals they're giving off that are left over from the influence of early trauma and attachment, Words would just go round and round. In other words, you could have two people who want it to work so badly, but if they don't deal with their own trauma, it's not going to work. Such a sad reality. And Dr. Nicole Opera, another gifted writer, teacher on trauma. If we have unprocessed trauma, being misunderstood literally feels like abandonment and rejection. Emotions like fear come up that send us in shame spirals. Our ego becomes defensive. It overexplains. It defaults into its favorite mode, judgment. In other words, unprocessed, unprocessed trauma causes us to misunderstand a whole bunch of things that happen to us. And then Dr. LaPera has said this, I knew I was healing when I started responding rather than reacting. I enjoyed alone time. I saw my parents as people with their own unresolved trauma. I set boundaries and when people didn't respect them, I knew they were clearing space for those who did. I was okay with being misunderstood. And then she takes it further. I knew I was done with trauma bonds. So that's how you connect to, un to people, but you always connect unhealthy people. So I knew I was done with trauma bonds when irresponsible behavior no longer seemed sexy, spontaneous, or appealing. In other words, weren't as attracted to the bad boys as used to be. I wasn't looking for someone to complete me. Relationships became a place to grow and evolve, not to reenact re childhood trauma. I took responsibility for my own happiness. I stopped betraying myself to be chosen. The way you react emotionally is felt by every cell in your body. If you want to have breakthroughs in your life, you have to break up your patterns. So well said. We can unlearn and relearn as adults, even if we're, we've endured significant trauma in our past. We can harness the power of our bodies to heal our minds and the power of our minds to heal our bodies. And then Dr. Janina Fisher. The key to healing is not just knowing what happened, but transforming how the mind, body, and soul still remember it. Most of all, healing is an act of accepting, reclaiming, and being able to love our most wounded and rejected young 
selves. So well said. She also says this, no recovery from trauma is possible without attending to issues of safety, care for the self, reparative connections to other human beings, and a renewed faith in the universe. The therapist's job is not just to be a witness to this process, but to teach the patient how. Diane Landberg, who's worked in the trauma field for 40 years now, says this, every time we treat someone with dignity rather than shame, respect rather than disregard, concern rather than exploitation, kindness rather than brutality, and careful attention rather than turning away, we are doing things that are the reverse of trauma and evil. And Stephen Porges, another trauma relationship specialist, when we're with significant others, the responsibility of that relationship is to keep our autonomic nervous system out of states of defense. He also says, trauma compromises our ability to engage with others by replacing patterns of connection with patterns of protection. So as long as we're in survival mode, we don't follow healthy connection patterns. Bethany Brand. When a lie has been embedded in the public consciousness, the truth has a difficult time making itself known. In other words, we need to be aware in recovery of lies that our culture spreads that we have believed that have kept us sick or unhealthy. She also says this, without trauma-informed treatment, traumatized clients may not respond optimally and they may even be re-traumatized by the mental health system if they are labeled as treatment resistant because the treatment does not address the core issue of trauma. Some may be misunderstood as fabricating or exaggerating their trauma history or symptoms. So sad, and many of you have experienced that. Donna Nakazawa, another trauma child development writer. Survival techniques don't have to be big to be powerful. The most important factor for flourishing with adversity is feeling you have a safe adult with whom you feel safe, seen, known, and to whom you can talk to about anything. Being that adult right now is more than enough. What doesn't kill you doesn't necessarily make you stronger. Far more often the opposite is true. The early chronic unpredictable stressors, losses, and adversities we face as children shape our biology in ways that predetermine our adult health. In other words, unresolved trauma in a child can lead to all kinds of medical problems. She also says this, it was as if I'd been running from my past, my story, my pain, and I'd run smack into myself again. By running away from stuff, we actually run into ourselves. Then she says this, ultimately, when you embrace the process of healing, despite your adverse childhood experiences, you don't just become who you might have been if you hadn't had, if you hadn't so much childhood suffering in the first place. You gain something better, the hard earned gift of life wisdom, which you bring forward into every arena of your life. So true. Bernie Siegel. Life is a labor pain. We are here to give birth to ourself. Profound way of saying it. Also says this, quite simply, after half a century of practicing medicine, I have become convinced that our number one public health problem is our childhood. Judith Herman, another therapist, Helplessness and isolation are the core experiences of trauma. 
Power and reconnections are the core experiences of recovery. So true. Lawrence Heller, another writer, it may come as a surprise that living life in a full and expanded way is one of the most difficult challenges we face as human beings. In other words, it's not easy to get healthy. Love that is conditional upon looks and performance is not love at all. The spontaneous movement in all of us is toward connection, health, and aliveness. Just as a plant spontaneously moves towards sunlight, there is in each of us an impulse toward connection and healing. Judith Blackstone, spiritual maturity is above all else a process of becoming real. So if you take the religion out of it, it's spirituality is about authenticity. This one is quite thought provoking. Spiritually sensitive children face a unique set of challenges. From early on, they live in a dimension of perception, emotional experience and insight that is not shared by most around them. Then Muhammad Ali. I hated every minute of training, but I said, don't quit. Suffer now and live the rest of your life as a champion. Henry Cloud is a psychologist who's written a number of books. Very helpful stuff. He says this, endings are a part of life and we are actually wired to execute them. But because of trauma, developmental failures and other reasons, we shy away from the steps that could open up whole new worlds of development and growth. In other words, complex trauma makes it hard to let go, but letting go would be one of the best things for our own growth. Then he says this, whatever is happening today, remember it's only one scene in a long movie. Don't treat it like it's the whole story. Keep writing the story. And I love this one. There is a difference between solitude and isolation. One is connected and one isn't. Solitude replenishes, isolation diminishes. And then this one. You can give a lot of yourself to others. You may be constantly helping people, but if it's all coming from you, it's not real connection. In order to connect, people must show up for you too. And this one is profound as well. A person who hasn't grieved a significant loss has unfinished business inside and can cause others great grief as a result. It's scary to realize that the only thing holding our friends to us isn't our performance or our lovability or their guilt or their obligation. The only thing that will keep them calling, spending time with us and putting up with us is love. And that's the one thing we can't control. If you can't be your authentic self, you are connecting with the wrong people. They're wasting your time and holding you back. Meaningful connections require you to be your authentic self. When two people are free to disagree, they are free to love. When they are not free, they live in fear and love dies. The fool tries to adjust the truth so he does not have to adjust to it. You will not grow without attempting to do things you are unable to do. Getting to the next level always requires ending something, leaving it behind, moving on. Growth demands that we move on. Without the ability to end things, people stay stuck, never becoming who they are meant to be. 
never accomplishing all that their talents and abilities should afford them. Getting better is not just about willing better performance, it's about becoming someone who performs better and performs differently. We have to be willing to change. And then Dr. Larry Crabb, a therapist. Beneath what our culture calls psychological disorder is a soul crying for what only community can provide. Elie Wiesel was a survivor of the Holocaust. My faith is a wounded faith, but my life is not without faith. I didn't divorce God, but I'm quarreling and arguing, arguing and questioning. It's a wounded faith. And then Corey Tenboom, who was also a survivor of the Holocaust. In order to realize the worth of the anchor, we need to feel the stress of the storm. And I love this one. Worrying is carrying tomorrow's load with today's strength carrying two days at once. It is moving into tomorrow ahead of time. Worrying doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow, it empties today of its strength. So profound. Or she says it this way, worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts whirling around a center of fear. Then T.D. Chapes, a uh, pastor in Texas, we all set out to make a difference in the world, but the first step is to achieve the less lofty goal of changing your own world. My mother would take the Band-Aid off, clean the wound and say, things that are covered don't heal well. My mother was right. Things that are covered do not heal well. There may come a time when you can't save the relationship, but you must save yourself. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. I hope it encouraged you, gave you some important reminders. So as we come to the end of another year, Kim and I just want to wish you the best as you head into 2022. and just hope that you continue to see growth in your own life and many wonderful things happening in your relationships and your family. See you next week.